everyone and welcome to Miss Estric Biology. In this video I'm going through topic 14, homeostasis. Everything you need to know for the CIE exam board. And if you do want a full set of notes that covers the entire A-level, key terms, key marking points and examiner's tips, then don't forget to check out my A-level notes which I'll link just below for you. But for now, let's get into the video. So let's get into topic 14 which is on homeostasis. And we're starting with homeostasis in mammals. So multicellular organisms require a communication system and animals and plants need this to respond to changes in their internal and external environment and to coordinate the activities of different organs to help them to survive. And these communication systems are the nervous and hormonal systems, which together coordinate the activities of the whole organism. So through chemical signaling, Cells are able to communicate with adjacent cells, but also cells that are really far away from them. The cells that the chemicals will affect are called target cells. And we're going to be looking at particular target cells in this video linked to controlling the water potential of the blood and the blood glucose concentration of the blood. Some chemical signals affect adjacent cells only, such as the release of neurotransmitter at the synapse. But that's in the nerve system video. Other chemicals, which is what we're focusing on in this video, they will have signals that transfer between distant cells and a large distance across the organism. So, for example, insulin, which is released by pancreatic cells, is transported in the blood to the liver, where it acts on the target cells, which are the liver cells, to regulate blood glucose concentration. So this video is all about homeostasis and the definition of that is the maintenance of a constant internal environment via physiological control systems. So essentially it's making sure that the conditions inside of you remain within set limits and if they get too high or too low then systems are put in place to bring it back within the set limits. And the things that are controlled or the conditions that are controlled are temperature, the pH of your blood, the amount of glucose in your blood and blood water potential. But we're only going to be focusing on the blood glucose concentration and the blood water potential. And homeostasis involves both negative and positive feedback loops. The two examples that we're looking at are focusing on negative feedback loops, which is a concept that if a condition is going to move outside of the set limits, mechanisms put in place to bring it back down or back up into that set limit. And that's what we can see here with our negative feedback loop. If we get this deviation from the set limit, and that is detected by the body, so a receptor would detect it, mechanisms are put in place to restore those conditions back within the set limits. So we can see here if the body temperature exceeds 37 degrees C, which is outside of the normal set limits, it's going to be detected by cells of the nervous system. That is then going to result in mechanisms happening such as sweating, which will then result in cooling, which brings your body temperature back to the normal limit. And this negative feedback involves the nervous system because you have to have receptors to detect the change. And it often involves hormones too, because those are chemicals that can cause the change to occur. So we're going to look at controlling the water potential of the blood first. And this involves the kidney because this is where the blood is filtered and excess water is removed. So this is also responsible for removing nitrogenous waste, not just excess water. And osmoregulation is the process or the term for controlling the water potential of the blood. And if we have a look at the kidney, we can see here the renal artery and the renal vein. The renal artery supplies the kidney with blood that needs to be filtered and the renal vein carries that filtered blood away from the kidney. The kidneys are made up of three distinct layers. We have the cortex, the medulla and the pelvis. So looking at these in a bit more detail then, those are three layers that we just talked about. We've got the cortex, medulla and pelvis. The cortex is a dark outer layer, so we can see here the cortex. And that contains capillary networks carrying blood from the renal arteries to the nephrons. The medulla, which is this section here, that contains the nephrons. And then lastly, we have the pelvis, which we can see here. 
that collects urine before it travels to the ureter. Now there's also this fibrous capsule that is a dense connective tissue layer enveloping the kidney. It provides support and protection. It adheres, which means sticks, to the renal cortex. And it's going to also maintain the shape and structure. So we can see here that fibrous capsule. It also acts as a barrier against mechanical stress and trauma. And it can isolate internal structures from potential infection or damage as well. So it's isolating the kidney. The renal blood supply we've briefly talked about already because we said we've got the renal artery which supplies the kidney with blood to be filtered and the renal vein which carries the filtered blood away. And then lastly the nephrons which we're going to be talking about in more detail. The nephrons are within the medulla. You actually have millions in each kidney and these are the structures where the blood is filtered and the useful substances are reabsorbed back into the blood through capillaries. And whatever isn't reabsorbed forms the filtrate, which goes on to forming the urine. So here we can see one of the nephrons inside of the medulla. And we're going to talk about what happens at each point of the nephron and what the different structures are. So we begin with the Bowman's capsule or the renal capsule, which is this bowl-like structure. That is where you have lots of blood vessels inside of it. So the capillaries that make up the glomerulus. That is where ultra filtration occurs, which is where you have a really high blood pressure forcing out the water and small molecules such as glucose and urea. And that forces out those molecules into the renal capsule and that now forms the glomerular filtrate. That filtrate then passes through the proximal convoluted tubule and that is where glucose is going to be reabsorbed but also some water gets reabsorbed at that point. The filtrate then moves down the descending loop of Henle and then back up the ascending loop of Henle and it's in the loop of Henle where we have sodium ions being actively transported out which will then be reabsorbed and also lots of water is going to move out by osmosis. Then the filtrate moves through the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct and at those points we have even more water being reabsorbed back into the blood from the filtrate. But if we go through each of those steps in more detail. The ultrafiltration, and this is what we said happens at the renal capsule or the Bowman's capsule, blood enters the glomerular the network of capillaries within the Bowman's capsule and because the blood enters through a blood vessel known as the afferent arterioles, which then splits into lots of smaller capillaries, which therefore have a narrower lumen, it results in this high hydrostatic pressure. So you've now got the same volume of blood, but in a smaller space. And that hydrostatic pressure is what causes the water and small molecules, such as glucose, mineral ions, um, and urea to be forced out and form the glomerular filtrate. Now this is showing you how you have that filtration occurring because this is showing you one of the capillaries that make up the glomerulus and capillaries are only one cell thick. So the gaps between those cells are small enough that you won't have large molecules being forced out like red blood cells and large proteins but small molecules can fit between those gaps. And that's what these tiny circles are meant to represent, the gaps between the cells in the wall of the capillary. Now, lining that capillary, you can see this blue layer, which is the basement membrane. And that is another layer that filters. And then surrounding those, you can see these yellowy beige colored cells, which are known as podocytes. And that creates another layer that the liquid has to pass through. So we've got those three filter layers. We've got once it's forced out of the holes or the gaps or the fenestrations in the capillary, it then has to pass through the basement membrane. That acts like a sieve. And then after that, it has to pass through the gaps between the cells, which are the podocyte. That filtrate will then flow through to the proximal convoluted tubule. And this is where we have most of the filtrate reabsorbed back into the blood, just leaving behind the urea, excess mineral ions and some of the excess water in the filtrate. The main things that are happening here, though, are 
the glucose is going to be actively transported. And this is an example of co-transport, much like you would have learned in digestion, the co-transport of sodium ions and glucose from the lumen into the cells. That is what's happening here as well. So sodium ions are going to be actively transported out of the epithelial cells in the proximal convoluted tubule into the blood, into the capillary. That lowers the concentration of sodium ions in the epithelial cells compared to the lumen, which is the hollow tube center. And therefore, sodium ions will move from the lumen into those epithelial cells lining the PCT. But as those sodium ions move in, down their concentration gradients, they're actually co-transported with glucose. So that's how glucose will enter the epithelial cells of the proximal convoluted tubule. And then the glucose can move from the epithelial cells into the blood by facilitated diffusion. And this is how all of the glucose is reabsorbed, or almost all of the glucose is reabsorbed from the filtrate back into the blood. And that is really important because we don't want to be losing glucose in our urine because glucose is needed for respiration. And if you do have excess glucose in your blood, that can be stored as glycogen, which we're coming on to later in this video. Now, some water does also get reabsorbed at this stage, and that's because as those sodium ions are actively transported from the epithelial cells into the blood, that lowers the water potential of the blood, so water can move by osmosis into the blood. But most of the water reabsorption is going to be happening in the loop of Henle. And what we have happening here is that filtrate passes from the proximal convoluted tubule into the loop of Henle down the descending limb. Now in this image, they're actually looped over or crossing over each other. The filtrate does go down the descending limb first and then up the ascending limb. And as the filtrate um, moves down the descending limb, this is where you're going to have water being reabsorbed. But that's only possible because of what happens in the ascending limb. So let's have a look at what happens in the ascending limb. You have mitochondria, you have lots of mitochondria in the walls of the cells lining the ascending limb. And that is so that they can provide ATP for energy to actively transport ions that are in the filtrate as it moves up the ascending limb. And those ions are transported out of the ascending loop of Henle to the surrounding space, which is known as the interstitial space. Because you now have lots of sodium ions, and also you have some chloride ions as well that are actually transported out, but lots of ions in that interstitial space, that lowers the water potential of the medulla in that interstitial space. Because the water potential is lower, that then means water will move out of the descending limb by osmosis. And the reason the water isn't moving out of the ascending limb is the ascending limb has much thicker walls which are impermeable to water. So water can only move out of the descending limb and it moves out by osmosis because of that more negative water potential. And once it moves out of the descending limb, it will then move into the blood capillaries. And that's why we say it's reabsorbed. It's going back into the blood. At the base of the ascending limb, some sodium ions are transported out by facilitated diffusion as there's now very dilute solution there because of all the water that is also moving out by osmosis. So when the filtrate then moves to the distal convoluted tubule or DCT and the collecting duct, even more water is reabsorbed back into the blood. And that is because of all the sodium ions that are being actively transported out of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle, lowering the water potential. So that when the filtrate reaches the distal convoluted tubule, that filtrate is very dilute because lots of the ions have been removed. And that filtrate moves into the DCT in the collecting duct. And at that point, the interstitial space in the medulla is very concentrated and you've got a very dilute solution. Therefore, even more water diffuses out of the DCT in the collecting duct. And whatever remains in terms of the filtrate in the collecting duct then goes on to form the urine. So that is how the nephron filters the blood. But we need to know how this links to homeostasis, meaning what happens when there's now too much water or too little water in the blood. And this is where we see the involvement of the nervous system.
and it involves the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary gland in particular. The hypothalamus is where you find the osmoreceptors, which are the cells that detect changes in the water potential of the blood. If the water potential of the blood is too low, water will leave those osmoreceptors by osmosis and it causes them to shrivel. And this stimulates the hypothalamus to produce more of the hormone ADH. If the water potential of the blood is too high, water will then move into the osmoreceptors by osmosis and this stimulates the hypothalamus to produce less ADH. So the hypothalamus is where this hormone ADH is produced. The ADH then moves from the hypothalamus into the posterior pituitary gland and it's the posterior pituitary gland which releases the ADH. And the ADH will then travel through the blood, bind to the target cells on the target organ, which are the kidney. So what is ADH then? ADH is antidiuretic hormone. And once it's been released by that posterior pituitary gland, transported in the blood, it will bind to complementary receptors, which are only located on the cell surface membranes of target cells, which are the kidney cells, specifically the cells lining the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct. So ADH is only going to affect those cells. When it binds, it activates adenocyclase to make cyclic AMP or CAMP. And that activates an enzyme which causes vesicles within the cells that contain aquaporins to fuse with the membrane. And aquaporins are channel proteins embedded within the cell surface membrane of the DCT and collecting duct, which allow water to be transported across the membrane. So if you have more aquaporins embedded in the membrane, that means the cell surface membrane is now more permeable to water. So more water can leave the distal convoluted tube and collecting duct to be reabsorbed back into the blood. So the more ADH that is released, the more aquaporins there are in the membrane and therefore the more water gets reabsorbed back into the blood. So that's what we can see happening here, and it results in lower volumes of urine being created, which are more concentrated. So we can see here, these are the vesicles that contain the aquaporins, which have been represented by these pink circles. Those vesicles then move and fuse with the cell surface membrane, so you get lots more aquaporins being embedded, and therefore more water can travel through the aquaporins back into the blood. So if we have a look then at how this helps to regulate the water potential, if the water potential of the blood increases, so meaning you've got too much water in your blood, so maybe you've had a lot to drink in terms of water, that is going to be detected by the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus. That causes the hypothalamus to produce less ADH and therefore the pituitary gland is going to release less ADH. That means the DCT and collecting duct walls become less permeable to water because you're not going to have as many aquaporins being embedded. Less water is reabsorbed into the blood and more water is therefore remaining in the filtrate to form the urine. So as a result, you have larger volumes of urine and it's more dilute, meaning more water in it. So you're removing that excess water and that brings the water potential back within the normal set limits. The opposite then is if the water potential of the blood decreases, meaning you don't have enough water in the blood. So maybe you haven't drunk enough water, maybe you've been sweating a lot. That will be detected by the osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus. That causes the hypothalamus to produce more ADH and therefore the posterior pituitary gland releases more ADH. That is released into the blood. That causes the DCT, the distal convoluted tubule, and the collecting duct walls to become more permeable to water. More water is reabsorbed back into the blood, and therefore you have smaller volumes of urine and it's more concentrated. And as a result, your water potential goes back to its normal set limit. Next, I'm going to have a look at the control of blood glucose concentrations, and this involves the pancreas. And the pancreas is a gland behind the stomach, it releases hormones to control blood glucose levels and therefore it's a functioning endocrine gland. It does actually also secrete enzymes for digestion, which means it's an exocrine gland as well.
Most of the pancreas is made up of exocrine tissue, so releasing those enzymes, amylases, proteases and lipases, but there is a small region of endocrine glands which are going to make up the islets of Langerhang. And these are the parts of interest for homeostasis. The islets of Langerhang are made up of alpha cells, which are going to be secreting glucagon, and beta cells that secrete insulin. And that is what we can see here. Whilst most of the cells here are exocrine, secreting enzyme, we can see here in blue those islets of Langerhang, which are cells that will be secreting the hormones linked to blood glucose concentration control. So the blood glucose concentration will increase following the ingestion of food or drink containing carbohydrates. And you do have to emphasize containing carbohydrates, not just saying after you've eaten um, or drunk, it's specifically containing, eaten or drunk anything that contains carbohydrates. And it's going to decrease if you haven't eaten anything that contains carbohydrates in a while, but also following exercise because exercise requires lots of ATP. ATP is produced from respiration and glucose is a respiratory substrate for that. So it'd be using up lots of glucose from the blood. So the key structures and hormones then are the pancreas because that is where you have your islets of Langerhang and that contains the receptors that detect the changes, but also the effectors, which will release the hormones, insulin and glucagon. We can have a look at the role of these hormones as well. Insulin is the hormone that's released when blood glucose levels are too high and it'll cause a decrease in the blood glucose levels. Glucagon is released when the glucose levels are too low. I always say think of glucagon is released when the glucose is gone and that will cause an increase in the blood glucose levels. Adrenaline isn't actually linked to homeostasis, but it is a hormone that will cause an increase in blood glucose levels, and it's released when you are anticipating danger, but it has the same effect as glucagon. So in terms of homeostasis, your normal blood glucose levels will increase following a carbohydrate-rich meal or drink. That increase is detected by the beta cells in the islets of Langerhang in the pancreas. The beta cells will release the hormone insulin. We're going to look at in more detail what insulin does, but insulin causes liver cells to become more permeable to glucose. Therefore, glucose can move from the blood into the liver cells. And once that glucose is inside of the liver cells, insulin also activates enzymes to convert glucose to insoluble glycogen stores. Therefore, glucose has been removed from the blood, stored as glycogen in cells, and we've gone back to our normal blood glucose limits. The opposite then is if the blood glucose levels decrease. So maybe you've done a lot of exercise and or you haven't eaten anything containing carbohydrates for quite a period of time. That decrease will be detected by the alpha cells in the islets of Langerhang and the pancreas. The alpha cells will then release the hormone glucagon. And glucagon, we're going to look at how that results in the glycogen being hydrolyzed back into glucose being released into the blood through the second messenger model. But ultimately, that is what happens. And therefore, glucose returns to the blood and it increases your blood glucose levels. So let's have a look at how you can measure the blood glucose levels. This could be using test strips and biosensors. And you might want to measure your blood glucose levels to test for diabetes, for example. And these are commonly used to measure the concentration of glucose in blood and urine. And these devices use enzyme reactions, and this is how they would work. So we've got the comparison of the test strips compared to the biosensors. And you can see what is on those strips versus the sensor, the enzymes used, the reactions involved, how it detects it, what's being measured, the output, the advantages of the two, and what it's being used for. So test strips are commonly used for quick on-the-spot glucose testing, whereas biosensors are used in more advanced glucose monitoring devices, um, including continuous glucose monitoring. So you can pause the video, read through this information in your own time, or you can pause, take a screenshot, print it out, and then you've got that table to go in your notes. But if we go back to then the effect of the hormones, and we're going to start with insulin. Insulin, we said, is secreted by the beta cells in the islets of Langerhang when blood glucose levels are too high, so following a carbohydrate-rich meal, and it results in the decrease in blood glucose in the following ways. 
First of all, the insulin, once it's secreted by those islets of Langerhang, it's transported in the blood and it will bind to complementary shaped receptors, which are embedded in the cell surface membrane of the target cells and the target organs, which is mainly the liver cells. When that insulin binds to the receptors, it changes the tertiary structure of glucose channel proteins and that results in them being wider, so more glucose can be transported from the blood into the cells by facilitated diffusion. Not only that, when the insulin binds, it results in more protein channels being embedded within the cell surface membrane. So again, more glucose is going to be absorbed from the blood into the liver cells. Now, all of that glucose that's been removed from the blood and into the cells has to be converted into glycogen because glucose is soluble. Therefore, it would lower the water potential of the cytoplasm of the cells, causing water to move into the cell by osmosis and the cell would burst. Whereas glycogen is insoluble. So that's why the insulin also activates enzymes to convert glucose to insoluble glycogen. And that's known as glycogenesis, making glycogen. Genesis means to make, glyco means glycogen. Now, this is actually just showing you the concept of how you get more channel proteins embedded within the membrane. So insulin, which is a hormone, is binding to the insulin receptors on the target cell of the liver. That causes a cascade of reactions here, which you don't need to know. But essentially, you have a range of different chemicals being released, which causes vesicles within the liver cells, which contain the aquaporins, to move up to the cell surface membrane, fuse and embed more glucose channel proteins. And because you then have more channel proteins embedded, more glucose can be absorbed into the cells. Then if we have a look at the action of glucagon, alpha cells in the islets of Langerhang detect when the blood glucose is too low and they will secrete glucagon. So when the glucose is gone, secrete glucagon. And this causes an increase in blood glucose in the following ways. Again, it's transported in the blood, attaches to complementary shaped glucagon receptors on the liver cells. But when the glucagon binds, it causes a protein to be activated into adenyl or adenylate cyclase and to convert ATP into cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP activates an enzyme, which is a protein kinase, and that enzyme can hydrolyze glycogen into glucose. And that glucose is then released back into the blood. It's also responsible for activating enzymes involved in converting glycerol from lipids and amino acids from proteins into glucose. And that step is gluconeogenesis. And that will only occur if you haven't eaten anything containing carbohydrates for a prolonged period of time and your glycogen stores have been used up. So let's have a look at this process in more detail. It's known as the second messenger model. We've got the glucagon binding to the receptors. We said that causes a change in shape to adenyl cyclase, which is an enzyme. And that change in shape of the enzyme activates the enzyme. So it can catalyze the reaction of converting ATP into cyclic AMP. This is known as the second messenger. And we call it a messenger because it's able to cause a change. So glucagon was the first messenger because when it bound, it caused this change here. The cyclic AMP can cause the change of inactive protein kinase to active protein kinase. And active protein kinase can catalyze the hydrolysis of glycogen into glucose. And that glucose will then be returned to the blood. So here are our key G words that have come up. And we have glycogenesis. Anytime you see glyco, that means glycogen. Genesis means to create. So glycogenesis is when we are creating glycogen from glucose. Glycogenolysis, we can even see the word glycogen written here. And lysis means to split. So glycogenolysis is the splitting or hydrolysis of glycogen back into glucose. Gluconeogenesis, gluco means glucose. Neo means new, genesis means to make. So gluconeogenesis is making new glucose from non-carbohydrate sources. So for example, the amino acids from proteins and the glycerols from lipids. So we then move on to homeostasis in plants. 
Stomata, which are vital for maintaining a constant internal environment in plants, respond to environmental changes by opening and closing. And this regulation of stomatal aperture, meaning how open or closed they are, is necessary for carbon dioxide uptake whilst reducing water loss by evaporation. So this is going to maintain a constant internal environment for the plants. It involves responding to environmental changes, so the opening and closing is the response, and it's going to help balance carbon dioxide uptake with water loss. So stomata will open if there is a high light intensity. Also, it's going to be triggered by low carbon dioxide within the leaf, because if the stomata is open, that means more carbon dioxide can diffuse into the leaf, and it will lead to more water loss, though, through transpiration. So if the stomata are open, you do get more carbon dioxide diffusing in, but you'll have more water vapour evaporating out. The stomata will close if it's darker. It's also going to be triggered by high carbon dioxide concentrations in the plants, triggered by low humidity and high temperature because you want to reduce water loss under those water stress conditions, because when it closes, it reduces transpiration and therefore it conserves water. So how that happens then? The guard cells are the cells that bend and change shape to create the stomata. And they are going to have these thickened celled walls with the cellulose fibres. The high density of chloroplasts and mitochondria. And they open when they gain water and become turgid. So the stomata opens when the guard cells bend. They're going to bend like this when lots of water moves in, causing the cell to become so full of water and turgid that they bend and create that opening. They will close when there isn't as much water inside of them, so the cells become flaccid. That causes them to close um, or move close together, so the stomata closes. So how that happens then? The opening involves the act of transport of hydrogen ions out of the guard cells, causing potassium ions to enter and decrease the water potential. Therefore, water enters the cells via osmosis, increasing that turgor pressure and leading to the stomata pore dilation. Or in other words, it opens. The closing is triggered by factors such as darkness and water stress, and it involves the um, stopping of the hydrogen ion pump proteins and the potassium ion efflux and water efflux. Also, the hormone... ABA plays a pivotal role in stomatal closure during water stress by stimulating calcium ion influx, which activates channel proteins to induce potassium ion efflux. And that will lead to guard cells becoming flaccid and the stomata closing. So ABA acts as a stress hormone, coordinating plant responses to challenging environmental conditions. So that is it for topic 14, homeostasis. Hope you found it helpful. If you did, don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any of my latest videos.